So before we begin the webinar proper, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands from which we are broadcasting today. The panel and I are broadcasting from the land of the Widjibal Waibal people of the Bundjalung Nation. We would like to pay our respects to elders of this land, both past and present, and extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait, Strait Islander people attending today's webinar or watching the recording. My name is Bridget Barker and I work in the Community Legal Education Branch at Legal Aid New South Wales. This webinar will take an hour in total, including time for questions and answers at the end. After the webinar, you will receive an evaluation survey and we really appreciate your feedback. You will also receive an email with information about resources we talk about today in the webinar. In today's webinar, we will be referring to the law in New South Wales and services available in New South Wales. If you are joining us from another state, these laws will not apply to you. The laws in your state may have some similarities um, or may differ. I will now introduce you to the panel. Um, we have Phil Crick, uh, who is a senior criminal solicitor at Legal Aid New South Wales in Lismore. Welcome, Phil. We also have Dave Mackey, a Detective Sergeant with New South Wales Police and Team Leader of Lismore Detectives. Good morning, Dave. Good morning. We also have Ange McAnally, Senior Witness Assistance Offer, Officer, excuse me, at the Lismore Office of New South Wales, Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions. Welcome, Ange. Good morning. And good morning, Katja. Katja is a um, Katja McPherson is a senior solicitor from the Northern Rivers Community Legal Centre. Good morning, Katja. Morning. Okay, just to let you know that uh, today's webinar will um, focus on a case scenario to prompt a discussion about the court process and support for victims. We're providing ge general legal information and not legal advice in the webinar. And as I said, we'll take questions at the end of the webinar. If you or someone you know um, are supporting or someone you are supporting has experienced a sexual assault or domestic violence, you may find today's discussion distressing. Here are some numbers that you can contact for support. Uh, the webinar is being recorded. So if you do find yourself distressed and, and need to leave, you could always come back to the recording later um, and, and view the recording. These uh, numbers are available 24 hours, seven days a week, um, and we will provide them in the email following the webinar. Okay, so I did send this out to this scenario out to people who had registered because there's a fair amount of information in it, but I'm going to read through the scenario now and then um, throw to our panel of experts to speak about the process. Daisy was in a long-term relationship with her partner, Rob. They have two children together who are 10 and 12 years old. Since having children, Daisy has worked as a school administrative assistant in a primary school. Rob was physically and verbally violent towards Daisy and controlled the family's finances, which made it difficult for Daisy to leave him. After a particularly violent assault, the police attended and removed Rob from the home. Daisy was granted an apprehended domestic violence order, excluding Rob from coming within 200 metres of the home where she continued living with the kids. On the 1st of July, 2021, Rob entered the home at night and sexually assaulted Daisy. He also physically assaulted her on her face and body. Daisy lost a few teeth during the assault. Rob breached the terms of the AVO by entering Daisy's home. After the sexual assault, Daisy was taken to hospital where she was examined and treated for her injuries. Daisy was supported by a sexual assault counsellor. Daisy spent a few days in hospital and was lucky that a close friend could mind her children for her. 
Police attended the hospital and took details from Daisy about the sexual assault. Rob was later arrested and charged with aggravated sexual assault. And we've given the sections of the Crimes Act in the body of the scenario. So section 61J, assault occasioning actual bodily harm, section 59 and common assault. And he was also charged under the Crimes Domestic and Personal Violence Act for contravening or breaching the apprehended domestic violence order. Rob was not granted bail and remains in custody awaiting service of the brief of evidence. When she left hospital, Daisy did not feel safe in her home anymore. So she and her kids moved to her parents' home. Daisy is hoping to get help to install some extra security there so she and her kids will feel safer. Daisy was unable to work for four weeks while she recovered from her injuries and got dental treatment. So Dave, um, I'll turn to you first. Would you please tell us uh, the point at which the police might become involved? This scenario gives one, um, I guess one scenario, um, but I, I imagine that can vary. Um, and what the process is once the police are contacted? Um, okay, yeah, so from a policing perspective, um, just in regards to this stated scenario with Daisy and Rob, so initially police would attend the hospital, whether that's a uniform officer or if uh, detectives were actually working, um, they would attend the hospital to speak with Daisy and medical staff. Um, so that would depend on the time frame in relation to when that occurred. So if there was a detective working, they would most likely attend initially because that would have been the information that was given. Um, but if it was after hours, there's always a detective on call. Um, so uh, a de detective would be recalled to attend the hospital. Um, it wouldn't matter what time of the day or night that was. Um, so after attending the hospital, we'd speak to, to Daisy and, and ascertain whether um, she had spoken to a counsellor um, from Indigo House, which is up, up this way. Um, it's a sexual assault service uh, with counsellors. Um, and whether that had been facilitated, that's normally done through the health system. Um, and then after that, uh, because obviously welfare is an aspect of it, not just the investigative side of things. Um, some, some victims don't like to have um, anyone with them. Um, they might not like to seek anything from a counsellor, uh, but more often than not, they're happy to, to liaise with them directly. Um, after that, a, um, sexual, a specifically trained sexual assault doctor would conduct um, a, what we call a SAKE, which is a sexual assault identification kit. So that's a physical exam, um, which is conducted by the doctor with the assistance of the counsellor as well. Um, so they're, they're specifically trained in um, conducting those examinations. Um, and that's for the purpose of um, collecting any physical and trace evidence that may have been um, left behind in relation to um, what's occurred. Um, so after that's done, the, the um, uh, Daisy would be requested to sign a release for that um, sake. Um, sometimes that happens straight away, but other times she may want to um, uh, hold off on signing that over because that's then given to police, which is sent down to our labs in Sydney for examination. Um, more often than not, they're signed straight away, but sometimes um, for varying different reasons, um, they don't want to sign consent for that to happen straight away. Um, Dave, can uh, I just ask, with the sake, um, are they, the people who are qualified to do those examinations, are they necessarily female um, no, or does that vary? No, that can vary. Um, uh, obviously we have um, male victims as well of yes. sexual assaults, um, but that's just something that's worked out um, between um, the victim and the hospital. They're a fairly scarce resource, um, I, I think up this way, I'm not sure. I think we just have female doctors. 
Um, so that'll just become a negotiation with the, the victim as to how they feel comfortable with, with who examines them. Because obviously it's um, a bit of a traumatic experience to first of all go through what they've gone through already and then have to um, be examined in that way. I imagine they could have a support person there if that were, they if can, someone yeah. were available. Yeah. They can, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so because of the, the seriousness of this particular incident, um, it would be uh, advisable for us to, for a detective to um, obtain a audio recorded statement. Um, most statements are taken in a police station um, and are typed um, when speaking to a, a victim. But in this circumstance, which is, which is not an uncommon circumstance, we do um, attend hospitals and different locations um, to take reports of sexual assaults. Um, but because of an ongoing fear that this particular scenario um, exists with, um, there's potential for evidence to be lost and also um, ongoing um, threats and intimidation from, from Rob. So we, what we would do would take a, um, uh, an audio recorded statement from Daisy. Um, that would be done in an environment that was, you know, uh, taken into consideration the privacy. So obviously when you're in a hospital, there's other people around. So we would sort an area out to, um, which would be appropriate to, to take that statement. Um, and that would be to get a version off Daisy as to what had occurred so that we could then work out what investigations we would need to carry out from there. Um, obviously there would be a crime scene um, so we needed to um, determine where that's occurred, with this, where the offences occurred. Um, and that would involve um, obtaining um, consent from Daisy to attend her house to conduct those examinations, which would um, be a forensic examination as well as an investigative um, search of the premises. Um, so that, that, that's our investigative process. Um, with Daisy at that particular point in time. Uh, we would also ask her to sign over consent for us to obtain the medical records in relation to what's occurred. Um, that's obviously going to contain evidence in relation to, to what's happened and comments that she's made that may assist the investigation. Because um, sometimes is that, we find... Is that limited, excuse me, is that limited to the records relating to treatment for the um, sexual assault? Yeah, yeah, unless unless there's a particular reason to, I mean, in this particular scenario, there's previous assaults. So we may, she may have attended the hospital on previous occasions um, and, and those records um, uh, could be used to corroborate that version from previous incidents as well. Okay, um, yeah. So it, it's generally is for that particular incident um, but depending on each circumstance that may be required to obtain other records. Um, and that would also be uh, permission to obtain a statement from the um, sexual assault doctor and also the, the um, general doctors that have examined Daisy uh, because of her injuries to, her, to the other areas of body like the teeth and things like that. Um, so then we would then go and conduct a, um, an examination of the, the property where this occurred, um, which would include um, attempting to identify any other witnesses. So there may be neighbours that have heard an altercation around the time. So we would approach neighbours um, to see if they heard or saw anything in relation to the incident. Um, and... Um, it doesn't actually state in this scenario, but the children are probably an important aspect of this investigation, whether they witnessed um, either visually or verbally anything occur. If that was the case, then statements would be obtained from them as well, but that would be done by um, appropriate, appropriately uh, qualified officers that um, are trained to obtain statements from, from trial witnesses. Um, so obviously we then get to a point after those um, investigations to take some action uh, against Rob. Um, in this scenario, he would be arrested and conveyed to um, the nearest police station. Um, he would be afforded his rights under LEPRA 
uh, part nine of LEPRA in relation to his rights whilst he was in custody at the police station. Uh, we would um, generally speak to the solicitor who's contacted for Rob um, to see whether he would be prepared to take part in an interview. Can uh, I just ask Dave um, for our um, audience today, part nine of LEPRA, so LEPRA is the law enforcement um, Sorry, I can't Respons think of it. Powers and Responsibilities Act. Thank yeah, you. It, it, it outlines um, certain rights that um, people in custody have. Um, the, most, the most common is to, to be able to speak to a solicitor, uh, to not have to answer any questions in relation to its cautions and things like that. Um, it also goes through welfare things for them about, um, you know, if they're intoxicated, they need time to recover from that. Um, it, it's fairly involved, so there's a lot of different um, uh, rights that have whilst they're in police custody. Um, Thank you. And, and that that um, depends on um, uh, whether they're adults, uh, ch uh, children, um, Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander. So there's a there's a it's a fairly um, uh, involved process in that. Uh, and one of those would be for them to have the opportunity to speak to a solicitor if they wish to do so. Um, and then we would go through that process if they wanted to be interviewed, um, take part in an interview. Um, and on this scenario, there appears to be sufficient evidence to be able to charge Rob with those offences. Um, so he would then be um, the, the uh, custody manager and would then determine whether bail would be an issue. In this particular incident, he would be refused bail by police, uh, which would mean that he would be kept in custody uh, to appear in bail uh, in court if it happened at night time the next day. Um, but if the process is, if it happened during the morning when he was arrested and we could get him before the court that day, he would go to court that day. Okay. Can I just ask some, I guess, some broader questions? And I'm sure that there's um, so many variations to this, but um after so the first question is bail and then um there would be a first appearance before the court on the substantive charges after police have prepared a brief of evidence is that correct yeah that's correct um so when on their first appearance after the bail um application is made um the magistrate would because it's initially heard in the local court the magistrate will make some directions in relation to pro, uh, providing a brief of evidence and service dates, um, and those dates are all legislated with timeframes. Um, so police would be given a particular date where they are required to provide a brief of evidence to both the prosecutors and the defence, um, and then the process would go go from there. Yeah. And I'm. I've, I've, you may find this hard to answer, but if in general terms, uh, say if the scenario were that Rob um, were to defend the charges and so they went to a full defended hearing, is could are you able to estimate a rough time frame that these matters generally take before that defended hearing would occur? So in in in. General terms with this type of offence, this matter would be ultimately heard in the district court. So initially it goes through the processes of the local court and then they're arraigned to the um, to the district court. But generally time frames, I mean, COVID's had an impact in regards to that aspect over the last couple of years. But in general terms, um, it's normally between, I would say, uh, 12 months to two years before a uh, matter would go to trial, um, generally at the, um, the upper end of that, so more towards the two-year mark. Um, that, and that's um, due to a number of factors, um, and each, each case is different, um, but that's generally the time frame that we're seeing at the moment. Okay. Is there anything else that you wanted to speak to about the police process? Um, no, not that I can think of, unless there's anything specific that you've you um, want to ask me. But no, that's that's basically uh, in general terms what would occur. We've just had one question that I might just deal with here. 
whether it's likely that there might be a break and enter charge um, against Rob based on this scenario. Yeah, there would be, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, Phil, we might throw to you next. So you're a defence solicitor in Legal Aid New South Wales crime. So you would become involved to represent the Rob, the accused in this scenario. Would you be able to um, speak to us about the point at which generally you'd become involved and what the processes are from your perspective representing an accused person? Yep. Um, so we may be um, called when the police are about to interview Rob. Um, they might call us and we might speak to Rob. That would depend on the time of day um, that, that it is, whether they call the local office or the uh, helpline. Um, but we definitely become involved um, once Rob is bail refused and is taken before the court. That would usually be the first time that we would see him. Um, We'd be at that point in time provided with his um, the fact sheet with the charges and uh, a criminal history for Rob, and then based on that, we would be looking at whether he could get bail or not. Now, given this scenario, it would be very unlikely. I would say that he would be granted bail in the local court um, if he'd been charged. There's, there's the previous assault where an AV, it says an AVO was um, made. Um, or taken out for Daisy's protection. If he'd actually been charged with some sort of assault or something there, then um, he would be probably on bail. And um, so these charges would then become what's called show cause um, charges. What that means is that the essentially the, the burden swaps around. Usually it's the burden is on prosecutors to show why bail should be refused and the court will um, consider um, several things such as the likelihood of a, a defendant failing to appear or whether they might uh, interfere with evidence or um, cause further uh, harm to the victim or the community or commit any further serious offences. They're the main bail concerns that the court will consider. Um, but it, when it's show calls, it swaps around the other way and it's assumed that the defendant will um, remain in custody, will be bail refused, unless um, there's some specific, specific justification as to why they should be uh, granted bail. The, the wording is um, why their detention is, is not justified. Um, in this circumstance, it would seem that it's almost, uh, it, it would be fairly impossible for Rob to get bail, so that would mean that he is in custody. Um, and as Dave mentioned, the, the magistrate would then make a brief service order. It's usually a six week period um, and the matters adjourned for eight weeks. So that first adjournment is two months. Um, and um, that's the first part of this process about five years ago, I think it was. Um, the laws uh, changed and the processes around these types of matters changed. Um, so um, it's now based on what's called the early appropriate guilty plea system. And that has three parts to it in the local court. The first part is the brief service. Um, and then the next part is what's called charge certification. And that is where the brief is handed to the uh, Director of Public Prosecutions, the DPP. And they will go through the evidence in the brief and determine if the evidence matches the charge that the police have laid, they may lay further charges, they may choose to withdraw a charge or exchange a charge for a different one at that point in time. And then they will um, hand a certificate to the court, to the local court that says, um, these are the charges that we intend to proceed with. And these are the ones that we would certify to go to the district court. Um, the next part of the EAGP process is a case conference. So the defence solicitor and the DPP solicitor probably in this situation also with counsel and, and the Crown um, would um, then get together and um, it's a bit of a shuttle process where um, we go between our client and go to the DPP. Um, we might make an offer to plead to a particular charge or something to try and resolve the matter. Um, or we might say, no, we can't make any offer. We're going to have to go to trial. 
um, the DPP might make an offer and say, well, look, if we see that there's a bit of double double uh, handling here, so we would, if you were to plead to one, one of these charges, we might withdraw the other one, they may, might make an offer as well. They have to go back to the police and to the victim um, to uh, discuss those sort of decisions though with them as well. Um, so that so that they have input. So the same way that we have to go to our client and say, um, what do you instruct us to do? The, the DPP have similar obligations to the police and the victim. Um, so once that case conference takes place, if um, there's a negotiated outcome, then the matter would be would come back before the court and um, the, before the local court still before the local court still. Um, and there are um, specified discounts put in place for this early appropriate guilty plea. If Rob was to enter a plea of guilty in the local court, he would then be committed for sentence and he would be entitled to a 25% discount on whatever sentence he was going to receive. Um, if he pleads not guilty in the local court and later decides to change his plea in the district court to guilty, then the maximum discount on sentence that he could receive is 10%. Essentially, those uh, discounts are for um, the utility of his plea uh, to a large extent, which means that uh, the expense and, and resources required in running a district court trial, which costs thousands of dollars, uh, is um, not required and, and the matter can proceed to sentence, which is much smoother. Part of the reason this EAGP process was also put in was because of the backlog of trials in the district court. Uh, and so they were trying to um, put a process in place that essentially puts all the hard work for the lawyers at the front end. Um, and, and so that the matter can be negotiated in the local court and there's less matters going to trial. Whether that is the case or not, I think is still yet to be seen. It does seem that it's probably made some impact on it. Um, but I agree with Dave that the, really 12 months would be the absolute quickest time that this matter would go to trial and um, probably more likely 18 months to 24 months. Um, the reason, there's a number of reasons for that. First is, is that um, if um, well, the DPP have up to six months to certify the charges. So they, from the first date that Rob goes to court, um, they then have six months to get the brief together and get to the charge certification. Um, it's then, it won't, if it's charge certified within that time, they can ask for longer um, and, and the defence can oppose that. If, um, I think it's unlikely in these circumstances, but the magistrate can, if, if the charge has not been certified within six months, the, the magistrate in the local court can discharge the defendant. But on these very serious charges, uh, it would be unlikely that a magistrate would do that. I think that, that would allow the police more time, especially if there was a reason why um, there was a delay in, in getting to charge certification. And now, in, in this circumstance, it, it seems that there's, there has been a, a forensic analysis done. And so sometimes those things can, can take some time to turn around uh, and to get the brief um, properly together with all of that material. Um, I guess I could, I, I could just a little bit about the charge, the section uh, 61J charge, it carries maximum penalty of 20 years. It has a 10 year standard on parole period. Uh, according to the statistics that I looked up this morning, 98.7% of people who was who uh, um, sentenced in relation to that receive a penalty of full-time custody. So that's out of 155 cases that are, that are mentioned in the statistics, 153 received full-time custody. Uh, only one received a community correction order, so what we used to call a good behaviour bond, and one matter was dealt with with a children's court penalty. So although it went up to the district court, um, it was a child and they were dealt with under the children's legislation. The general terms range um, from, it, it, it's very wide ranging, because it depends on a number of factors that they range from 12 months to 20 years as a head sentence. The average is probably six to eight years. Um, the non-parole period range is again, 12 months through to 16 years, and the average is about three to six years. So although it carries a standard non-parole period of 10 years, um, that only applies if a person does take it to trial and lose, then they would be expected if it's, if it's they, the court would call uh, uh, in the middle range of objective seriousness type of offence, 
then that 10 years would um, start to come into effect for, as a standard of parole period. Can I ask you, Phil, what factors might, um, aside from your client's instructions, are there any other factors that might um, determine whether you um, don't get a negotiated outcome and go to um, a trial in the district court? Um, no, it really is probably the client's instructions. They are the, they are the ones we we look at the we look at the evidence in the brief. We assess the strength of the prosecution case, and then and then advise the client on that, and and provide him with what might be options for, for that could be negotiated. And then it is. Um, and then it is up to the client to say, this is what I want to do. Now, this one, I mean, I, I think our advice in this one was that Rob should be pleading guilty already just on, on um, the scenario that's there. Um, it's it's not a case where DNA evidence is, it would seem to be taking it any further or anything like that. It's it's uh, obviously Rob is well known to Daisy um, and, and it's unlikely that she's mistaken his identification. I guess there is potentially uh some sort of um issue around consent however with the other violence that's attached that would seem unlikely as well thank you and i'm just uh conscious of the time i could um speak to each of you for the full hour um and i might turn to you now uh would you please uh tell us what your service does the witness assistance service and at what point you become involved with a victim of sexual assault so the Witness Assistance Service is a part of the ODPP across uh, the state. Um, our primary task is to support victims of crime throughout the court um, and vulnerable people throughout the prosecution of, of matters in New South Wales. So our aim is to provide um, support to victims of crime and vulnerable witnesses. Um, and to try and minimise any re-traumatisation throughout the criminal justice system process. Um, the key functions that we have are working with the prosecutors, uh, as well as the police and also inter-agencies to help um, us meet our obligations under the Charter of Victims' Rights. So in terms of when the witness assistant becomes involved, um, once a matter is uh, referred to the DPP by police of this nature. Um, sorry, just to backtrack, witness assistance has a certain priority of matters that we deal with, uh, of which the DAISY scenario is one. We deal with all um, sexual assault victims, child sexual assault and um, other matters involving death and domestic violence. Uh, so once the matter is referred to the DPP, Witness assistance, it, it gets referred to our intake team in Sydney. So they will register uh, DAISY on the system. Um, an intake assessment call will be made to DAISY. And as part of that assessment, they'll be ascertaining uh, information that the allocated WAS officer can use to assist DAISY throughout the court process. One of the first questions, which the scenario doesn't actually say, one of the first questions we uh, that would be asked in the intake process is whether Daisy and her children identified as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. If the answer to that question was yes, then we would refer Daisy and her children to a specialised Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander was officer, and we've got a number of those sprinkled throughout our statewide offices. Um, so the aim is to provide culturally appropriate supports? Absolutely, yeah, yeah absolutely. So once that intake call is made, um, other information they'll be finding out initially is what supports external and uh, in other words, um, other services Daisy has been referred to and also what family supports she has whether or not she has been engaged in any counselling um, and also questions along the lines of how much contact does Daisy wish to have from the DPP, when is the best time to get her, all that sort of information. Once that occurs, um, the Intake Sydney uh, team will notify me as the locational senior in, in the Lismore office 
I can then allocate the matter to an allocated was officer. They'll do a more extensive assessment and they'll find out information more to do with what uh, local supports Daisy has in, in regards to counselling, whether she's got a sexual assault counsellor, also whether or not the children have been referred to any counselling. Um, they would be under the Victim Services Scheme entitled to secondary victim counselling as well. Um, as Days raised before, they may have witnessed or observed some conduct uh, that had previously happened in the in the home with Rob and Daisy. Um, we would be asking Daisy whether or not um, she's had information provided uh, to her about escaping violence payments or the immediate need support package through victim services. Uh, we'd be talking to her about uh, alternate contacts, whether there's somebody that she would refer us to contact in the event that we can't get her. Um, we'd be talking about the role of witness assistance service and, and the DPP and where we fit in. Um, we'd also be discussing in that assessment things like the possible timeframes that Bill and Dave have referred to. Um, we'd be talking to them about facilitating an introduction call with the solicitor with carriage once that solicitor has been allocated. Um, and we'd also be talking about things like uh, initial contact would include discussions around confidentiality and also disclosures of information that Daisy may provide to the witness assistance officer throughout the process that has to be disclosed to the legal team and um, potentially uh, also to the defence if it in any way impacts on the matter. Um, depending on which way this scenario went in terms of whether it was to go to proceed to a sentence, we would assist be assisting Daisy with um, information about victims' impact statements uh, and the provisions around that. Um, we'd also uh, be talking to her about uh, the provisions of court if should she have to go to court, if the matter were to proceed to a trial in the district court, we'd be explaining to Daisy that, you know, given the nature of the charges, the legislation provides that she can give her evidence in a remote witness room, um, and that it in fact will be a closed court when she gives her evidence. Um, we'd be explaining to Daisy that um, part of the witness sister assistance service can provide court support to her, although we would be exploring other options. If Daisy had a family friend or a family member that wasn't a witness in the matter that could provide it, uh, support to her while she gives her evidence. Uh, we'd also be talking about um, facilitating conferences with Daisy prior, throughout the matter. Uh, but also more particularly uh, before any district court trial were to occur, the witness assistance service would be helping facilitate conferences for her to attend the office, meet with the Crown Prosecutor and the solicitor and do some court preparation with her. Um, the witness assistance service case managers, so from the beginning processes, when we first do assessments, we'll be in contact with Daisy throughout the process and we'll be ascertaining from her how much contact she would like from our service. Some people, some victims would like to have contact after every mention. Some con uh, victims would like to just have contact when something significant happens in the process. Um, in terms of just referring back to what Bill talked about with the uh, case conference scenario, um, witness assistance would become very much involved in facilitating a conference with Daisy at the point um, that a case conference were to occur to discuss the outcome of that case conference. So in other words, if there was some um, plea offer discussed and a resolution possible, uh, we would be liaising with Daisy and giving her updates. 
So it's important for Daisy to kept, be kept informed throughout the whole process. So you have a long involvement with victims and um, stick with them through the process um, with them having, I guess, the power to determine how that contact happens. And um, yeah, that's, that's yeah. great. Yeah, so we're sort of there right from the start all the way through to the completion of the matter, essentially, no matter which way it goes, whether it goes to a sentence and it's obviously going to uh, finalise a lot quicker for Daisy. If it goes to a trial scenario in the district court, it's obviously going to take a lot longer and we would be supporting that her and her family through the court process if she had to come to court and give evidence. Thanks, Ange. I'm just noting the time, so we'll move on, on there so that we can get to Katja and some questions at the end. So Katja, um, I'll just move the slides on. Um, you work for a community legal centre, um, the Northern Rivers Community Legal Centre. How might your service become involved with a victim? Yeah, thanks, Bridget. Um, I'm involved with the legal service, so I'll be talking about uh, the legal response, but we do auspice a WDVCAS service who would also become involved in this scenario. So um, probably once the police were informed, there would be an automatic referral to a um, Women's Domestic Violence Court Advocacy Service, and they would also provide support to the woman. Um, but in terms of uh, the victim support scheme, uh, I'm just going to give a bit of an overview there. There's probably a big range of experience with the scheme, so I'll just move quickly. But I'll really commend to you the victim support scheme quick guide, which will be um, come with the email with these slides. Um, Bridget will send that out. It's a really great summary of what's available under the scheme. But just to move through it, uh, to be eligible, you need to be a victim of a violent crime that occurred in New South Wales. We are up near the border and often uh, there is an issue that the violence hasn't actually occurred in New South Wales, although that's where the victim is now. So this scheme is for acts of violence in New South Wales. It doesn't matter if the victim now lives interstate. Uh, they can still apply and access um, counselling in that state, um, but the violence need to have occurred in New South Wales. Uh, the other requirement that it be a violent crime, unfortunately for this scheme, the definition of domestic violence is much more limited uh, than what we understand violence to be. And so for the purposes of this scheme, generally only physical violence is recognised as uh, an act of violence under this scheme. Um, it's worth getting le legal advice about that um, because uh, some uh, stalking and intimidation can, can move into that, um, but in general, physical violence is required. Uh, that's something we're advocating about because obviously this is a very um, limited definition of violence and um, uh, other areas are, are recognising um, that effect more. So there are four components to the scheme and just touched on the free counselling that's available. It's just important to note that that needs to be a victim support approved counsellor. Bridget, do you mind just going back one slide? Yeah, okay, yeah sorry. Um, it has to be an approved counsellor and there's a list of them on the website. So uh, that's also a bit unfortunate if you have a relationship with someone but they're not approved, uh, that won't be free. They can apply for approval, which is a quick process, something to be aware of if you have an established relationship with someone and uh, want to access free counselling through them, ask them if they can apply for that. And again, uh, as Ange mentioned, available for children who might have witnessed violence and parents of child victims. The next two categories are financial assistance. The immediate needs is for things that are urgently necessary to secure the health, safety and well-being of the victim because of the act of violence. Uh, and up to $5,000 is available in this category. So there is for victims of domestic violence, there's a new sort of fast track process for accessing some money as an immediate need, which is really great. So where a victim needs to relocate or increase security, lump sum payments are available before you've incurred that as expense. Um, victim services recognise that often women needed to get out, needed to get 
um, relocated or get extra security on and didn't have a few thousand dollars to make that happen. So uh, service providers could help um, victims get what's necessary for these payments. It's the application form and ID. Uh, if it's been reported to police, as in Daisy's case, it's quite a straightforward process because victim service will access information directly from police. And then that money, uh, I've seen it paid within three days, uh, generally within two weeks that, that lump sum can be paid out. So that's great, but it's only available in um, matters where there's been domestic violence. Uh, where there isn't domestic violence, then the person needs to submit receipts or a quote and um, be reimbursed in that way. And it's a bit of a slower process, unfortunately. Um, if your service offers brokerage for those sort of expenses, that's a way you can really support victims um, because often that is a problem. It's also important when you apply for those things to make sure you explain how that results from the act of violence and how it's urgently necessary to secure your health, safety or well-being. And if you put that in the initial email to victim services, it will just mean that's processed quickly. The second category is financial assistance for economic loss, which is expenses that you've incurred because of the violence. Uh, the examples are medical and dental expenses, lost wages, attending criminal proceedings, damaged personal effects, and uh, as a uh, generally up to $30,000 is available in this category, although there's some sublimits for different things. Um, you will need receipts or invoices or quotes. So for Daisy, she would need something from her dentist to say the, how much the treatment is going to cost. And she would probably need something from the dentist that said what she's having treatment for is consistent with the assault that she has reported. So that is a limit that victims do need to tell their doctors or their dentists, even their employer, about why they've had time off work in order to be able to claim those expenses under the scheme. And, and that can be a bit limiting. So uh, if, she want, if she wasn't paid for those four weeks that she was off work, she could claim that under this scheme, but she would need a letter from her employer saying they understood that she took four weeks off uh, because of this incident and to detail that she wasn't paid in that time. And you're not actually paid your actual wages, you're paid a sort of standard amount based on the workers' compensation amount. So that's something to be mindful of too. And finally, recognition payments. This is what many people call compensation, although it's been deliberately not called that because it is far from compensation. Uh, the, the scheme that's been in place since 2013 has much more limited amounts payable as these payments, and the focus is more on the reimbursement for costs associated with the violence. So the lowest amount is $1,500, which is generally awarded for assault. And this is even where there are multiple assaults. So that is something our sector is really advocating um, for, that there be a recognition that where there's multiple assaults, this is grossly inadequate. Uh, if the victim is a child, um, they're up in the next category, which is $5,000. So that is for uh, assault for children, uh, one incident of sexual assault or an assault causing serious harm. The next category is $10,000, which is for aggravated sexual assault, um, multiple offenders or with a weapon. And then for homicide victims, $15,000 for dependents and $7,500 for family victims. I think something to be mindful of a lot of this process, it'd be great if support workers can help victims to um, access this. You might want to get some legal advice if you think there might be a bit of contention about what recognition payment. So we're often helping with submissions where we want to say that an assault caused serious harm of a psychological nature. Uh, there's often some arguments to be made there, uh, or maybe that the sexual assault should move to that um, more aggravated uh, $10,000 category. It might be worthwhile having legal advice to just help um, maximise the chance of that being paid. So the evidence um, is on the next slide, it's quite straightforward. If it's been reported to police, victim services will get information from the police. 
It doesn't need to be reported to police, which has been a great change. And if it hasn't been, a report to a government-funded service can be submitted instead of a police report. So if you are a service provider uh, helping uh, victims of violence, if you can write a letter and there's a form on the victim services website, what's required, you can detail what's been disclosed to you and that's helpful for the victim. And then injury, doctor's report, hospital records or a letter from a counsellor is generally um, what you'd use there. So for Daisy, I mean, we've discussed some of the things. So uh, she could lodge the application at any time. The only thing is that once it's lodged, you've only got 12 months to submit your evidence. And that is where uh, victims need to submit their own evidence other than the police records. Victim services don't do any um, obtaining of evidence. So support workers can be very helpful in that. And a year feels like a long time, but particularly if they're historical medical records, it's important to get onto that straight away and start applying. Uh, so Daisy, because it's domestic violence, could apply for that immediate needs support package to increase the security on her home, changing locks, cameras, alarms, security windows and doors. They're the sort of expenses that are available you do sign that you will spend the money on those expenses so it's important to encourage victims to keep receipts in case that is audited in the future although I haven't seen that in my own experience yet um, uh, and as her recognition payment we'd be asking for that ten thousand dollar category because she suffered physical assault at the same time as the sexual assault so uh, that might be worth getting legal advice and there's some legal assistance services that'll be on the, the slides at the end uh, if you want legal advice there i think i might leave it there so we've got time for questions thank you thank you Katja. that's great uh, so I've just put up some information here um, provided by Victim Services um, and I will send um, <clears throat> the, this is a handout to all people who've registered for the webinar. So you don't need to take this information down, but um, you'll get the links in the email to the quick guide that Katya referred to. Um, and uh, also just for any uh, community workers and support workers, who might want an information session. Um, victim services do provide information sessions, so you can email requesting that. Um, these are, this next slide is um, the numbers where you can um, get some legal help. Um, we've included the Northern Rivers Community Legal Centre because Catcher is with us on the panel today, but uh, depending on where you're living, um, you can follow the link to find a community legal centre near you to um, get help through uh, legal aid. Our intake number is the law access number. Um, and this, these are the numbers for the witness assistance scheme. So I'll just turn to the questions. Um, if I'm hoping that uh, we can get through them in five minutes, but we might go a couple minutes over time if the panel's able to hang in there for us. Um, we did receive some questions prior to the webinar and one question sort of relates to time limits. Um, if a sexual assault happened four years ago and has not been reported, can they still do that? So I'm just wondering, Dave or, or Phil, if you're able to speak to <coughs> yeah. time limits. I can answer that. Yes, yeah. um, sexual assaults don't have a statute of limitations. So um, it doesn't matter how long ago the offence occurred, it would still be investigated if the victim wished it to be so. So, um, in, in fact, a, a bulk of our sexual assault matters are historical matters. So um, there's no legislation preventing you from um, reporting those matters. Thank you. Um, I, I think some of you did address this, um, but um, a question about how the court is helping not to re-traumatise victims. Um, uh, uh, Ange spoke about... Um, witnesses are victims giving evidence remotely is there anything else anybody would like to respond to in relation to that question well while they think about that sorry can i just throw in the time limits for victim support which i sure. didn't cover so um generally there's a two-year time limit to apply for victim support and that is for the financial 
uh, um, assistance, there's a two-year time limit. Uh, if the victim is a victim of domestic violence, there's a 10-year time limit for the recognition payment. And for childhood sexual assault, there is a, a no time limit for applying for victim support. Thank you. Um, and you might address this question. Um, are there particular support services or a change in court processes um, if someone under the age of 18 is involved or people with intellectual, cognitive or communication disabilities? Okay, so just to answer the first part of that question, um, there are provisions for young witnesses to give evidence. Um, also, the legislation provides that they can give their evidence in the remote witness room for a start and the court would be closed. Um, there is also a child sexual assault evidence program that currently runs in Sydney and Newcastle and New South Wales, whereby witness intermediary is able to assist that young person uh, to give evidence. Um, in terms of somebody with a disability, um, there is provision for the Justice Advocacy Service to assist that person to give evidence. However, we've recently been fortunate enough to, in some of the regional courts, be able to use an out-of-program witness intermediary um, to assist people with disabilities to give evidence. Um, that was of great benefit. I recently was in a trial not so long ago in a regional court and having the witness intermediary assist somebody with an intellectual disability made the court process go so much smoother for everybody. It is the witness intermediary assisted the court, they're independent, so they assist the Crown as well as Defence Council, as well as the court. So it was a really great uh, example of how moving forward we can assist people who have higher communication needs to give the best evidence that they can. Oh, that's great, great to hear. Mm. Um, uh, a question that occurred earlier about why Rob would be refused bail, is it because there's too much evidence against him? Um, from the police perspective, that would be more so um, uh, victim protection. He's, he's already on an AVO for previous offences against this victim and the, um, the offences that he's committed on this occasion are, are serious offences as well. So it's, it's more so um, to prevent further offences from occurring. And I, I think that that's the same way that the court would view it as well. They, they would look at the risk factors and the main risk factor would be victim protection. Um, and as I said, because, because it would seem that he's probably already been charged with some sort of assault previously and is probably on bail, then it is likely that it is a show cause bail. So unless there's some particular feature about Rob um, or if, if there was a real weakness in the police case that we could see on the face of it, we might be able to make an application for bail. Um, Rob, of course, has a right to apply for bail, so he can apply for bail if he's bail refused in the local court. He can uh, apply to the Supreme Court for a review of that bail um, by the Supreme Court. Thank you. Um, a question about whether a court would ever refuse to accept the charge certification or the results of the case conference if they feel it's not appropriate um, for the defendant to receive discounts due to the severity of the crime? Yes, so uh, in relation to uh, the charge certificate is up to the DPP. I don't think the court would um, refuse it. Uh, it'd be, I haven't seen that happen at all. The case conference is actually uh, confidential. And so there's a, at the end of that, there's a certificate also handed up to the court. It's uh, in a sealed envelope though. And it just outlines the um, negotiations and what offers were made and if they were rejected. Uh, that remains in a sealed envelope on the file, goes up to the district court. And then if there's a dispute as to what sort of discount the person should receive as to when an offer was made, or, what plea was entered at a particular time, that case conference certificate might be opened up at that point in time to show, look, we made this offer back at the case conference and you rejected it at that point in time. But now you're saying you're accepted, so we should get the 25% discount. There is, um, the, the, the prosecution 
can uh, make an application that the offence is so serious that the discount regime shouldn't apply in a particular circumstance um, as well. Thank you. Uh, there's a question that um, I guess takes it outside the scenario that we've discussed. Um, so if the um, alleged offender um, or accused is um, not known to the victim, um, if they were asked to identify them, what kind of identification processes might um, might they go through um, in order for the police to investigate and uh, identify who that who might who they mish, might wish to question? Okay, so um, just say in this particular scenario, it was an unknown offender who'd broken into the house. Obviously, the uh, physical examination, um, forensic examination of the house would be um, important to identify, uh, to locate um, forensic evidence such as DNA, hair um, and fingerprints. Um, also, the um, samples obtained during the SAIC would also be analysed to try and identify an offender that way. Um, in relation to visual identification, if a suspect was known or to become known, um, there's certain legislation into in relation to how identifications are conducted. Um, I think I saw something there about a one-way mirror in one of the mm. questions there. Um, so visual identifications are primarily meant to be made uh, in, in like um, live. So the the suspects would be. In the presence of the victim, that can that is done behind a one-way mirror. However, um, I've in my 32 years of service, I've only done that uh, on two occasions. I think um, most of the time, um, suspects uh, don't wish to be uh, take part, which is their right in an identification probe that way. And in that situation, you would then move on to photographs. Um, and have a uh, visual identification by photographs. Thank you. Um, and there's a question about transition out of your service once um, the matters are finalised uh, for victims that your service has been involved with. I, I guess it's been a long relationship. Um, yeah, so it has been a, a long relationship. Um, it differs from that of a relationship with a counsellor in terms of that's more of a therapeutic nature. Um, but certainly a transition would be at the completion of a matter, regardless of which way it would go. Uh, we would obviously be doing a debrief with, the, with Daisy uh, or any victim of crime, um, depending on what the outcome was, if the matter resolved in a sentence matter, we would be assisting them through that process, through their completion, and then we would be referring them to victims, uh, the community, uh, sorry, the corrective services victims register, if that were applicable, um, or else, you know, if the matter didn't resolve in a sentence and it was just the outcome of the trial, and it didn't resolve in a sentence, then we would be debriefing and facilitating a conference with the legal team to debrief. And that would be kind of the, the end of our interaction with that person at the completion of the matter. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've had some, a few questions that sort of relate to um, mandatory reporting and um, victim and offender being under 18. Um, can any of you answer how the process might change um, where a victim is under 18 and an offender is under 18? Uh, I can briefly discuss mandatory reporting. That relates to, um, uh, to children. Um, so mandatory reporting is only relevant um, in that situation with um, people under 18. Um, and there's, there's a number of different mandatory reporters like um, uh, hospital staff, teachers, counsellors and things like that. Um, so uh, that relates to uh, victims. In And what was the question in relation to if uh, offenders if, are over 18? If an offender were under 18. 
uh, the, the matter is still investigated. Um, there is, if we're talking sexual offences, um, uh, there's legislation in relation to ages of victims as to consent. Um, certain victims can't consent um, to sexual acts, um, but there is a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, consensual basis if, if um, uh, the, um, the two people involved um, are separated by two years or less and it's consensual, then there's no offence. Thank you. Um... We, we have some questions that I won't address now because we can respond to them um, by email afterwards, but there's a question about reproductive coercion and sexual ass assault being significant in many in relationships involving domestic violence, whether there's any rec recognition of this and the difficulties in providing evidence in those sorts of matters. Have any of you struck that? That you're talking anybody? about is that continued violence in in a in a domestic situation where the victims doesn't wish to report matters, or I think it's a, a, about um, the difficulty of gathering evidence where it's a continuing relationship um, that's involved sexual assault within a domestic relationship. Oh, look, there, there can be difficulties in that regard, but each matter is investigated on its merits. Um, once someone makes a complaint, it just comes down to investigating the matter to, to uh, obtain sufficient evidence as to whether there's sufficient evidence to um, prosecute anyone in relation to those offences. But there, there definitely is difficult difficulties in, in that area. Thank you. I'm just conscious of the time and um, we've we've gone a bit over time. So um, I think we'll we'll round things off there, but I'll just let our audience know that um, any questions that we haven't responded to, I will um, make sure that we respond to them following today's webinar um, by email. Um, and just putting those numbers for support up again, in case anyone's um, found this discussion today distressed, distressing, excuse me. Um, and I would just like to say a big thank you to all of our panel members for taking the time to participate in the webinar today and to um, just let our audience know that it has been recorded and we will uh, load it up onto the Legal Aid YouTube channel and I can share the link with you once that process has happened. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. And we'll leave the webinar there.